Welcome to Off Panel, Sketch.com's weekly podcast. This week's guest is the writer of, well, a whole lot of books you've probably read, including his image comic series with Nick Dragata, East of West. It's Jonathan Hickman. Thanks for coming on the show, Jonathan. Uh, absolutely, man. Anytime. So today we're going to be talking about East of West, which you and Nick have been building for the past few years to some pretty major places. And I have to admit, I did my duty and actually reread the entire series for this podcast, and it really underlines something that readers probably know you for. You really have a plan when it comes to your work, don't you? Sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you don't really seem like a fly-by-night writer, really. Well, I, I usually um, – it, it's tough to explain how your head works to somebody whose head doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I generally – see the end of a project is the first thing that I get. Hmm. So, uh, I almost always have the conclusion of the story that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. And when you start working on something like East of West or, or any of the longer books or longer runs that I've done, when you know how the story is supposed to end, um, the fun is in finding the organic stuff in between the beginning and the end. And so a lot of the, of, of where we're at now and where we were at the end of the, of year one in East of West, uh, a lot of that is super organic and, and it's kind of a result of the way that Nick and I work, but, uh, I always know, I, I almost always know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I I always wonder how different writers and different artists and you know everybody works, but that actually makes a lot of sense, especially for a creator-owned series. It's it's like you know you have this story you 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 know you want to tell, and it's not like I guess some people work off high concepts like it's Battlestar Galactica meets Tron or something like that. But it seems like if you if you're really going into it with a, I think you guys were planning this for you know fifty issues or something like that, right? Something like that. We'll we'll end up we'll we'll end up somewhere around there. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if you have kind of an idea of how far you want to go, you probably have a pretty good idea as to where you want to go to as well. Uh, you know, I was going to ask. Your degree is in architecture, right? I have an architecture degree. Yes. Yeah, I w I was curious because my wife is actually an architect, and the way she approaches projects. You know, as as long as clients let her, is it's it's very systematic. It's like a very systematic way of like I don't know. She looks at everything very analytically, and I'm curious: does that background and also your background working in advertising does that impact how you think and feel about the structure of your writing at all? I I have no formal training, so uh, in the first. Beyond, beyond uh, just a, an exercise that I did uh, just to see if I could write dialogue and, and write a scene or write a sequence or, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, everything I've ever written has seen print. Wow. Uh, and so a lot of a lot of what I am doing, uh, what I've done for the past decade I, which is crazy to say, but I think this no uh, I think this November, yeah, this November will be when Nightly News uh, first came out. That's crazy. Um, it is crazy. Uh, but almost all of that has been uh, an educational process, me figuring things out, and 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 yes, uh, I'm very graphic in the way that I figure out how stories work, meaning that I do a lot of kind of flow charty stuff and character maps and just kind of figure out who's connected to who and all of that. But then when I go about go go about executing the story, certainly a good chunk of it is is um, I won't I won't say uh, by rote because that's not true, because uh, a lot of it is 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 organic. But I think analytical is fair. Mm -hmm. Uh I, I think, but a, a lot of that is changing too, as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I just now feel it sounds ridiculous to say this stuff because I've done so many books over the past couple of years, but I feel like I'm just now getting to the place where, um, I can start a story 
on Monday that I didn't come up with until Sunday and, and, and just begin it and start writing and not care about where I'm going, which is something, which is something uh, a lot of my friends, uh, in the industry uh, that, I mean, that's just how they write all the time, mm-hmm. uh, which, which it seems so alien to me. But, um, I, I think another thing that helps is I, I look at it all as just a big experimental process. Um, if I'm getting ready to start a new project, I just want to try new things and I just want to make the experience enjoyable for myself and I want to uh, try and challenge myself in some way. And so I'll I'll come up with a ridiculous um, parameter or, or objective for the, for the story um, and, and I'll try and make that work. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, I try not to get bored, um, which, which is a really long, long winded answer of, yes, I'm often very, uh, a, I am often like your wife, a robot feigning, feigning human emotion, <laughs> but I, um, I'm learning to love. So, yeah, she's, she's excellent at feigning human emotion to the point where I'm pretty sure she just has emotions. But yeah, I, I think that is interesting. <laughs> like you were saying, you know, you didn't really have formal training in writing or I guess writing comics. So it does seem like a lot. I guess it's kind of hard to look at your Fantastic Four run, for example, or the Nightly News or doing something like Red Wing or something like that as as like your kind of training ground. But I guess it has been if you're looking at any artist or writer or anything like that as you're perpetually finding your voice, so to speak. Sure, I think that's true. But I mean, I I. I had no idea what I was doing on Fantastic Four in regard in regards to writing something that was longer than six issues. I had never done it before. Man, you could have fooled um, the living hell out of me. And so, um, I mean, I had a plan. Obviously, I had a plan, but uh, th- that the execution of it was like you can kind of see. Like the first longer thing that I did was Secret Warriors. And it was like 30 issues. And then I did Fantastic Four, which was a little bit longer. Um, but but you could see how much better I got from one to the other just in managing the length of the story. Um, now, Avengers had numerous problems um, th- that that I think did not lend itself to me considering it to be a, a, a success. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even though financially we made plenty of money and obviously the conclusion secret wars was really big and 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 came off pretty well but um that was that was an exercise in the double shipping and and i mean i was writing yeah i was writing 36 issues of that a year wow uh and considering the fact that the longest series that i had ever written before that was about 36 issues is just <laughs> is just insane but again i mean i look at all of that stuff as a positive experience because you learn through all of it um you know and i, I mean I, what i learned from that is i'll never do a double shipping book again if i can help it mm-hmm. um but um you know i think if you have an open mind and you're and you're willing to attack the the problem the storytelling stuff um you know you can you can figure it out uh you know we're 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 most people are storytellers by nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really, it's really repetition and having a perspective that matters. So, mm-hmm. well, and as as far as like you're talking about how with East of West your approach was, you knew where you were going to go, or like with any of your projects. But one thing I really I think is really impressive is you look at the world one shot and you have. You have like the endless nation, all the breakdown of how their money is coming in. And you look at like the kingdom and look at their power and everything like that. It seems like you have a pretty good idea of like not just the idea of this world, but some of the details and everything like that. When you start a project, do you kind of have those things figured out or are the details of something like, I don't know, for example, the endless nation, something you're figuring out um, as you move along? Uh, it's a, it's a trick. It's an illusion. It's, um, uh, yes, I know that I want to add more stuff there and I know that I want, uh, there to be more information. 
Uh, and I know that at some point I'm going to fill in the gaps that I left, but, um, you know, the, the best person that I've ever heard explain this. And I, and when I use this example, I'm not in any way comparing myself to these guys cause they're absolute masters. But I heard, uh, the breaking bad guy, Vince Gilligan talking about how, how they do their show. And, and one of their rules is that they don't introduce new concepts into the book after, or, or into the show after they reach a certain point, like the, the, the primary thing that they try and do is they try and mine their own history of the show to find clever ways to make the future events tie into the past events. And what that creates is an immersive, uh, uh, um, you know, a more immersive world. And you're actually enriching the previous work by continuing to reference it in the future. And so if you are writing about the endless nation and you know that there are going to be three or four things that you think are going to be important, then it's okay to imply that they're important and to imply that what they are, as long as you leave yourself in the writing enough ambiguity to go back in and plug it in. And then you're like, then you're closing the loop and then you've created a feedback loop within the story where it's self, you know, people that go back and reread it, it's self-referential. Um, and if you do that enough time, enough times, the, the, you know, just to continue the analogy, the resonance of the entire project begins to feel so much more broad and immersive and it feels like a world. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing on, that's what we're doing on East of West. Um, absolutely. We, we left it, we, we opened with a lot of vague implications about the world and what was going on. And as we move forward, we, we continue to kind of circle back around to what we originally introduced. Um, um, but that's the best way to it. That, that's the best way I've ever heard it explained. And that pretty much encapsulates how I, I generally do that stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, that actually makes my thoughts about Better Call Saul change quite a bit also. I mean, I, I love that show, but still, it's it's funny watching that and thinking about Tio Salamanca and Tuco Salamanca and everything. But anyways, that's going in a completely different direction. But that's something I wanted to ask about. I want to ask about your process. And I have to admit, one thing I've never completely understood was Marvel style. And, and you guys work in Marvel style, right? <laughs> At best, it's Marvel style. At best, <laughs> so is is it like the Jonathan Hickman and Nick Dragata variation on Marvel style? We're very loose. <laughs> um, I have, I have, I have just given Nick. We we just talked out a book on on the phone before. Mm. Uh, we don't do we don't do that very often. But um, uh, you know, Nick is Nick and Frank are a. Uh, well, they're very good. Um, they're even better together. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I don't know which one is chocolate and which one is peanut butter. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the Voltron like amalgam of the two of them, uh, are, are very powerful storytellers. Um, and they're also very fast. You know, Nick has been doing issues of East to West in about two weeks, the wow. last probably eight or nine issues. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, Nick Nick is very fast and very talented, but a lot of that is he leaves he he understands how to work with a very very talented colorist and he just leaves Frank a lot of a lot of places to play and and to be Frank. And and so um when you have people on the art side that are that are um you know that are that are so in sync it, it certainly makes it easier for you to just let them dance. And that that's kind of what we do. I, I leave all of the action very open. Um, I will, I'll tell Nick, um, look, this is a scene where Archibald and his niece talk to, uh, this syndicate guy from Japan and they have a clever back and forth, but at some point he drinks a poisonous cup of tea and he kills over and dies and they think it's funny. 
right? Um, and I know that I know that Nick will will make that interesting, and then I go back and write the script based on 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 the art that they deliver. Um, and I and I try and be unless I have a specific a uh, couple of lines of dialogue, or unless I have a very very specific point to the scene, I try and you know get 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 the hell out of the way of, mm-hmm. of those guys and and let Nick co-author the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so East of West more than anything else feels like um, uh, I'm co-writing a book. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean that that's the interesting thing about. Uh... I was reading up because I'll, I'll be doing a podcast with Nick soon, and I was reading up on how he works. And it's interesting with the way you guys work in Marvel style and everything like that. You know, he can really dictate the pace so well with his art, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, but th- th- that's one of the things that really stood out while rereading the book is between the pages you put in as story breaks with quotes and everything like that and the way that Nick splits up – the pages so there's more room for character interactions and more room for hard story beats in there uh it really it it has a feel that's completely unlike any other comic and when you combine that with the way you write dialogue it really feels like um i I know it's a sci-fi western but it really feels like the western trappings are really evident in the style and the tone and the mood and everything and i love that uh yeah i mean we we feel like it is a very good book. Uh, we both feel like it's probably the best thing, certainly that we've done together. Um, uh, we're, we're proud of it, man. I mean, it, it's, um, uh, the people that like that book really, really like that book. Um, and, and, and we're super appreciative of it. And, you know, we've sold a whole bunch of them and, uh, we've been really, really, uh, our, our numbers have been fairly consistent considering we're on what issue 25. And so, um, you know, that, that book is a success any way that you measure it. And we're, we're pretty grateful for it, but we know that a lot of that comes from us, just, um, us being just totally synced up on the story we want to tell. Mm-hmm. So you and Nick first paired up on FF, right? Yes. So what was it that made him, like, did you guys develop this book together, or did you just kind of start putting this together and you realized Nick would be a great fit for it? Uh, well, we, we did some FF stuff together, and it was, and it was very clear that, that we did – we worked well together. I think the first issue, the first issue he did was that silent issue after – uh, you know, we, we did the Johnny storm, uh, death thing, uh, where we did it. but, um, and then he did a couple more things after that. He did, he did the end of, of the FF run, which was really, really good. I'm just so, good. um, but no, I mean, we, we got along and, and then we met at the very first image expo, which was kind of like the celebration of 20 or 25 years of image comics. And we had, we had lunch and, uh, Nick didn't know exactly what he wanted to do, except that he was tired of being a Marvel guy that was being overlooked or on, put on the wrong books or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, um you know, we just decided to do a book and, and it was really that simple. He was like, what do you want to do a book? I was like, yes, I want to do a book. Let's do a book. And he was like, all right, I'm serious. Let's do a book. And I was like, let's do a book. I mean, (laughs) uh, it's, it's not that hard. We're not going to have to pitch it or anything like that. I'll tell Eric that we're doing the book and he knows your art and he knows that it'll be good and we'll go do a really good book. And, um, and it was that simple. And then all we did was kind of throw images back and forth at each other. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he showed me a lot of, um, kind of Knights of Sidonia stuff and, and, and some other manga. And I, uh, kind of showed him some visuals that I was thinking about. And then I told him that I think I want to do a Western that's also kind of a sci-fi. And he was like, that sounds cool. And then I, I, I went off and I wrote the first script. And then since then we've just kind of been back and forth, um, so it's it's a really easy book to do because we both get it and we know what we're doing and we're both um, we're both good at our jobs and um, 
we get out of each other's way when we need to. And both of us know that we appreciate each other and it's just how it's supposed to be. It's not how it's supposed to be done. It's how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would never tell somebody how they're supposed to do their work. So, well, I mean, it's kind of like the idealized version for you two. I mean, it's exactly what you guys want to do, and I I do think it's kind of funny that the genesis of, genesis of it was really you guys just sitting at lunch and agreeing to do a comic very easily. I don't know. I I think when people think of great creative unions and stuff like that, there's like a romanticized view of it, but it's probably much more simple than that. Yeah, I mean, I I'm working on some stuff right now with some guys. Um, well, let me let me say this. Uh, I think that coming into uh, being a, a writer in this instance, uh, and I don't really I don't really think of myself that way uh, a, a lot of the times. Um, like Alan Moore's a writer, mm-hmm. like a writer, or, or or Jason Aaron is a writer. Um, Ed Brubaker is a writer. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm like a guy doing parlor tricks or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, uh, I, I don't like the idea of, un- unless it is a specific thing that I have already come up with and I have already fully realized the world. And I, I have this, um, I have this finished thing already in my head. I don't, I, I very rarely, try and figure out a book ahead of time and then go find somebody. I think that's not the way that you're supposed to do it. Um, uh, I, I, that's not true. That's a way to do it. But, but I, I think that's, if you're talking about a pure collaboration, I don't think that's the way that you should do it. Uh, I, I think you decided, you decide to do a book with someone and then y- you, you talk about what kind of book you want to do. um, uh, I, 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 this, this whole thing of, uh, you know, I've written this thing for you and it's a fantastic story about a gerbil who gets mutant powers and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, I, I think you'd be great for it. Um, and the person pretty much draws all neo noir stuff. It's just, a t- <laughs> it's like, it's like a, it's like a terrible kind of fit. So I, I think you have to, I think you have to tailor the projects for the people that you're working with. And, mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the day, it's about making each other, uh, both happy and, and, and making each other, uh, you know, money so you can make a living at this thing. And so, mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 most thing the, the, as many obstacles as you can get out of the way when you're talking about two creative people who have you know who are super opinionated and have as you know pretty crystallized views on how things should be done like if you can eliminate the vast majority of those things before you start a project you should do that mm-hmm. um so but that's just you know, that's running your business. That really doesn't have anything to do with telling a story. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it matters. I think it gets I think it gets in the way a lot of the time. I definitely agree. And, and I think that, like, granted, everyone has their own way to work and everyone has, um, you know, some writers do crazy full scripts. I remember reading Warren Ellis's uh, Come in Alone column. I don't know if you ever read it, but it was on comic book resources a long time ago. But Anyways, they published a book of it, and I remember reading this one section on the the different types of scripts people would write. And some of them were so dense with detail, and there was just so much on a single panel. And it was like other ones were really simple. Like the one, like the one you were describing of the interaction between Archibald Chamberlain and his niece and the Japanese, uh, I don't know, mercenary orchestrator or whatever. Um, uh, anyways, and... Uh, it, it is interesting how different you can work. It kind of seems to me that Marvel style could be more collaborative. And in some ways, it could work in a better way to feature both collaborators' ideas better. But I don't know. That's just my view as an outsider. I think uh, I think it was – I'm pretty sure it was uh, Fra- Matt Fraction who told me this. Uh, he told me that he was talking to one of the twins. I, I don't remember if it was Gabriel or Fabio. Um but they were talking about his scripts and they told him that the first sentence was for them. And then the rest of it was for Matt, (laughs) you know? And so, um, I, listen, I have certainly written very, very long 
that first east of west script was was very long and had all of the detail in it um because i wanted to give i wanted to give nick everything that i could that was in my head like that was a, that's that's an important thing um but once once you're there um some of this is is getting out of the way um I think it probably has something to do with being economical and not being up your own ass. But, um, you know, that when you're locked in a room all day long, it's hard. It's hard not to occasionally do that. Mm -hmm. I have to ask about your process for a specific issue, because one of my favorite single issues of the past year was uh, was was East of West number 22. The uh, the mostly silent issue that you guys did. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's kind of hilarious. I forgot you guys had done an, a silent oh. issue for FF. I was thinking this was, you know, it, it's definitely something that's atypical in comics. I think people mostly think of that old G.I. Joe comic where I think it was Storm Shadow being silent for the entire issue. Dude, a lot of a lot of Snake Eyes people are going to be upset at you. <laughs> oh, God. Snake Eyes, my bad. <laughs> um, anyways, wrong ninja. But wh why was that something you guys wanted to do for that issue? W was that something you knew from the start? Or was it just kind of how Nick told the story just made you dial back the dialogue for that one? No, I told Nick that we were going to do a silent issue because I thought that he needed to like show everybody how good he was. And I thought that it was a good point in the story to remind everybody just how on top of his game he is. And so I uh, I told him we were going to do a silent issue and we went back and forth about it. But um, I did win that argument. Um, <laughs> so Nick argued against it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm just, I'm just trying to make myself sound good. Uh, no, I, he... He was, if I'm remembering correctly, he was a little leery about feeling like people were going to be getting their money's worth. And mm -hmm. my opinion on that is that more often than not, um, that's a totally subjective thing. Mm -hmm. And people either feel good or feel bad when they're done with the issue. And that's the only thing that matters. And uh, I mean, there's probably more factors there, but in a general sense, uh, and I, I thought it was a perfectly good time for him to strut. And so I wrote a beat sheet of what I thought should happen in the book. And, um, Nick, Nick just went nuts and delivered a really, really cool issue. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, a lot of the location stuff was in there. But a lot of the a lot of the specific visuals were not um, like that gun that was also a text thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where I don't know where he got that from, but I love that. The one where he wrote um, failure wasn't it, wasn't it failure? Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. The text gun was uh, was, <laughs> was pretty great. Um, but the interesting thing he did was that I had it all broken down into increments of time per page. And he went in there and made pay whole pages, one panel, and then expanded one page into a four or five page sequence. He just changed, he changed the rhythm of it. And I think it just works so much better. Mm -hmm. I actually just realized this, this is probably something I should have realized the first time, but just to let you know, Jonathan, I'm, I'm a horrifically illiterate person, so apparently when reading comics, I don't realize things until way later. But when he typed in failure, was that the only way he could shoot himself? Do you have any idea if that was the case or like that was what Nick was thinking? Uh, if that's what you think what <laughs> happened, then there you go. Uh... <laughs> well, there you go. I, well, I'm totally making that up in my head. That is what happened. But I thought that issue was really fantastic. But I do totally see what Nick was saying because – you know, with, with the whole people not getting their money's worth thing, it is funny that how there's a mentality sometimes where if you read a comic in 10 minutes, you don't get your money's worth. But two of my favorite comics in the last year were, were that one and the first issue of Mark Wade and Chris Somney and Matt Wilson's Black Widow, which really only had dialogue at the very end. And like th th those issues blew me away. And, and if you look at it at a cost per word paradigm, I guess – it probably wouldn't be a very good return. But at the same time, I think you're right in the sense that it's 
you know, value is a very subjective thing. And it's very based off of, you know, how the reader feels after closing the last page. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it, I don't believe that, um, the way to define comics is how many words you can cram on the page, even though I try really, really hard sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's either, it's either a good book or a bad book at the end of the day. And if, if we would have done a terrible job on that issue or if Chris Sam Somney would have bombed on that black widow issue, uh, only thing people would say is what a waste of money. Mm -hmm. I, I do have to ask because I'm sure you've gotten your fair bit of guff for them, but you have you have like you have all of your transition pages you work into your projects is that something still people still bring up to you like why do you do that or is that something that's accepted for your work now um i i mean i love them well i i don't i don't i don't care <laughs> if people have an opinion on it i'm going to design my books the way that i want my books to be designed mm -hmm. and and at the end of the day, I, my books either look good or they look bad. And all of my books look good, especially when you compare them to a bunch of the other trades that are on the market. And mm -hmm. so people are demonstratively wrong in, in, in that regard. Uh, saying just because cohesiveness and homogeny is not a bad thing when it comes to doing a collected uh, amount of work. Mm -hmm. uh, but – I don't get any of that flack from people who buy my books that are image books. That's interesting. I don't I don't I don't get any of that static. And the reason and the reason why is because people buy image books by me because they're interested in books by me. Mm -hmm. Um when people buy Avengers, uh and and it's always if I if I worked at DC, it would be the same way with the DC fans. It's it's just really dumb Marvel fans who who think that uh, they're being ripped off for. The only thing they would get in return for it is a is a Skittles ad or a, a Volvo <laughs> ad or or whatever. And the idea that they would rather have that than a thing that makes the book more cohesive. That's a that's a. Um. I won't say that's as dumb as an anti-science position, mm -hmm. but it's up there. You know, it, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tasteless, ignorant position. Uh, but I, I understand it because what they're really saying is that this Avengers book doesn't look like an Avengers book, mm -hmm. and and I want to buy an Avengers book, not a Jonathan Hickman book. And I understand that. I don't care. Mm -hmm. That they feel that way because um, I'm going to do uh, – what's the best way to say this? Um, our industry is is built on creators you – know, the last 50 years has kind of been built on creators not getting their fair shake – or, or, or their recognition, recognition or compensation. Mm -hmm. Um, and absolutely when I first started in this industry, one of my objectives was every book that I do should feel like a book by me. Mm -hmm. If I, if I do not do that, then I am, all I'm doing is producing more books that some guy will have done at some point in the future. And, I, I do not believe that that is the kind of creator that I wanted to be. And so I very consciously from day one produce books that look like quote unquote Jonathan Hickman books. And um, some people really like it. Some people think it's uh, narcissistic and some people think it's very um, – Elitist isn't the right word, but they certainly think it's it's um, <laughs> it, it's conceited. Mm -hmm. Probably conceited is a fair word, but I don't I don't care about those people because they care more about Ant Man than they care about me as a creator, and I and I fundamentally disagree with that. I, I think um, I, I think that the that the that, that this is a talent driven industry and i believe that the talent is more important than the franchises and uh, i absolutely in almost every ideological argument that you can have will always side with with uh, 
with the talent and and uh, and us getting our fair shake. And that's kind of the great thing about image right now. Um, we're finally in a position where we're getting to keep the lion's share of the money and we have enough of the market share that, that it's a significant amount of creators. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not just important, it's righteous. And so, and I know this is, I, I'm, I'm taking the long way around and I'm being, <laughs> and, and I'm kind of preaching about it when you just ask me about a bunch of white pages, but it's, <laughs> but, but, but it's all kind of the same thing. Like, like it, it all comes from the same place of, of which do you value the art, the artist position or the, or the, or, or the machine's position. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I care very much about how my books look and I want them to look like my books. Um, and you know, I don't do that in a vacuum that that's considered with all of my partners that I work with and that I create things with. Um, but, but you know, people, my collaborators appreciate that about me. It's not a, it's not a detriment, you know? Mm hmm. Well, and, and that's the thing, though, for Avengers books and stuff like that. I know a lot of readers have been conditioned to expect one thing, and you did something that they never really seen before. But for something like East to West, or, or really all of your stuff, I think the thing that really stands out about it is the people who are buying your image stuff definitely realize this. But when when you read, like I said, I, I was rereading the second volume, and there's this one bit where Prophet Ezra Orion has been infiltrated by the Beast, and he's got this right arm, and it's now, well... It's, it's horrible. And anyways, the next two two little transition pages where it says, are you an agent of the end times? And then it says, have you become what the message demands? I mean, that's storytelling. Those are hard beats to deliver story there. And I just, I mean, to me, I, I think sometimes people look at one type of thing as story rather than something like that is adding to the story. I, I, I don't know. But I completely agree with everything you were saying about the creator stuff. I, I do think it's sometimes... Sometimes there are barriers that you have that have to be broken down in people to realize that like comics don't have to just be one thing, I guess. Like they don't have to be what you've always expected them to be. They could be something different. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of my stuff going forward from this point, um, where I'm at creatively right now is because I've had a pretty successful last couple of years, I'm able to kind of pick and choose how I'm, how I'm, uh, both utilizing my resources and my time. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, almost all the books that I'm going to produce are going to, uh, really push it in terms of what you can do in a comic. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, contemporaries have started putting a bunch of back matter in the books and, and, um, which read as afterthoughts, uh, which is, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of that content is fantastic, but it, it, it's not when I, when I say that my books are going to ship now with a bunch of extra stuff in it, it, it's not that kind of thing. It's all, it's all like the, that world one shot where it's all things that inform the world of the story. Um, I want, I want people when they pick up the books from, from the front cover to the back cover, get nothing but an immersive experience. Um, and so, uh, I'm really, really going to push it, uh, this coming year, starting with the book that Tom Coker and I are doing, um, the black Monday murders, uh, and I'm super excited and super proud of that stuff. Uh, I think, I think, um, some people won't like it, but the people that dig what I'm trying to do, um, will really, really like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you about that. I, I personally, I did an entire article on back matter because there's, I think there's some really interesting stuff that adds to the story and the world and everything, especially in image comics. Like I really like what, uh, what Greg Rucka and Michael Lark and Eric Troutman and everybody, uh, have been doing on Lazarus. Yeah. And, um, but I, I really like that in the black Monday murders, your bonus content in the back is going to include maps and it's going to include organizational charts and quote unquote investment advice, which I'm a total I'm a total sucker for back matter. And granted, you know, I could always use a little bit more money. So investment advice is always welcome. But 
Uh, so this is going, is, is this going to be the first time people really see you doing full out back matter? Well, it won't be back matter. It'll be, um, interspersed throughout. Well, like how I've done hard beats in, um, in, in my other work, that stuff will be in there too. But also when I introduce a bunch of characters, the next thing in the book isn't necessarily a continuation of the narrative. It's a scene break. And I tell you a lot more about the characters or the company that they work for or the way that they operate, or I explain the language that they're using, or we show inner office documents about some deal that they did, which will inform the scene that's going to come after that. Um, and so it, it, it's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just afterwards. It's, it's, it's actual narrative. So it's like, do do you read Nowhere Men by, uh, by Eric Stevenson? Uh, Eric, Eric's book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I I really like, uh, I like, I like how they use that kind of bonus content interspersed throughout, like, you know, interviews with scientists and an organizational chart on the back of every issue, or I guess it's not really an organizational chart. It's more of like a relational chart as to how people connect and everything like that. But, um, that type of stuff, it adds so much value to the story within the story. And I I don't know, I I love it, but I, I'm really excited for it. I, I do have to say the the Black Monday Murders has maybe the best solicit I've read in a very, very long time. Granted, I don't always read solicits, but when you say, and I quote, it's adult Harry Potter where the various schools of magic are actually clandestine banking cartels who control all of society. Man, I read that, and as I said in the email, or in an email to you, I was laughing when I read that because it was so awesome sounding to me. Well, um, this is one of those things where I got the whole thing at one, at once, you know, I, I, um, I was reading, (laughs) I was reading a book about economics. I don't know why (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea why I was doing that, but I was reading a book about economics and there was a, 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 a bit in there about the, uh, uh, the origins of, 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 of mathematics and, and actually of all communication. And, and they were talking about how, um, the, you know, the first recording of, of language that we have, you know, the first, the first, um, the first writings that we have, not, not, pictures like in the caves and all that kind of stuff, actual, Mm -hmm. actual language. Uh, it wasn't a poem or poetry or anything like that. Almost all of the early records that we got had to do with finance. And Mm -hmm. I, I just started thinking about how, if all of our language is based on, on, um, is, has its origin in the exchange and the bartering of things, uh, and if everything has the root of, of money at it, I, I just, I, there was a thing about language and math and money and it being at the origin of all communication and, uh, and just the way that people talk about w- what power really is and what influence really is. And I just, I just kind of, I, it kind of unlocked this entire, um, uh, I don't want to say gaming system, but, but rules for this magic system, mm-hmm. um, that, that, that is real, you mm-hmm. know, that, that's, that's, it explains why, why wealthy people live better lives. You know, it explains why they live longer. It explains why, you know, all, all of that, it's all about the acquisition of influence. And so, um, what if that was real, what if that was the real artifact of, of, of magic? And so, <laughs> You know, it, it, it got out of control from there and, um, it, it explains, like I explain what, what, uh, financial collapses come from and why they happen and how they're, how they're stopped and what the, what the result is. And, um, it, it, it's, it's a, it is, it is one of my favorite things that I have written. Mm -hmm. It is, um, um, it's it's really sharp it's on point it's 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 timely uh it's really timely it's um uh and it's just a it's one of those things where 
it's a look at reality that's kind of that's kind of uh, you know a little twisted but it makes perfect sense even mm-hmm. though it's even though it's total fiction right mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you you read the story and you find out all the stuff that's happened and why it's happened and, and it's it's uh it's uh it 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 it's perfectly logical. It's a perfectly logical lie, which are the the best kind, you know? Yeah, I, I actually, it, it's funny because like you're saying, it feels very timely and it also feels like something I could easily see somebody reading this and actually thinking that Putin is a vampire Russian oligarch. Sure. Uh, I, I could easily see that happening. So, so does this mean that you had to read more than just one book about economics or did you just? Well, I had. I have read more than one book about it. <laughs> well, first you were saying you didn't know why you did it. Now it seems like you've got what? you're too far gone. Oh, uh, I fell down the rabbit hole a little bit. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I can tell you that, like um, that book, just reading, you know, reading the preview and reading the solicit, it feels. I was trying to find the best way to phrase this without saying I'm like like I'm putting you in a box or something like that. But reading the solicit felt like maximum Hickman in my mind. So uh, I don't know. Take that how you will. I think that sounds great. <laughs> I, uh, I think we need uh, we we could all use a little bit more maximum pigment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you have Tom Coker on the book, who is who is somebody I really love, and I haven't seen him do anything in a while. And I just wanted to, uh, well, I, I like I said, I read the preview for Black Monday Murders, and his art is so spectacular, and it it just looks amazing. What made him somebody you wanted to partner up with on this Maximum Hickman project? Well, this is absolutely peak Tom Tom Coker. Uh, he is he is killing this, and it is so beautiful and so competent, and um, he's he's just great. And I've loved his work for a very long time. Um, but it, it it basically came about because I was. Um, I was asking people what he was working on and nobody knew and somebody that knew him uh, got us together and I was like, do you want to do a book? And he was like, yes. And I was like, well, let's do a book. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it was it was really that simple. And I've wanted to work with him for a really long time. And um, and uh, he's killing it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just um I just love this book so much. It's um, his art style. If you don't, well, it's kind of like with Dragata, where people didn't really know Nick that well. Mm-hmm. Um, but when he started doing East of West, he kind of exploded. Um, it, this will be the same way for Tom. Like Tom's been out of the scene for a little bit. I, the last thing he did that was pretty big was an image book called Undying Love. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's done, he's done, he did the ride and he's done, he did one of those, uh, Ronin, uh, um, Wolverine books, um, which was beautiful. But, uh, Tom is a superstar and he should be, uh, seen as a superstar. And I think, I think this book is going to, uh, be very good for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's my, it's, it's my, uh, it's my wildest hope. So I'm fairly confident that's going to be the case. Uh, I mean, unless for the, the rest of the first issue, he's drawing in stick figures after the first four pages. I, I think he's going to be, uh, people are going to be blown away, but I have to ask, it seems like you're pretty, well, I'd say it's a fair statement that you're pretty invested in the way that Image Comics does comics. And I think I think one of the amazing things about today's industry is uh, I was talking to Eric Stevenson about this at, at Emerald City Comic Con a few years ago. And it's like we were talking about John Lehman and Rob Guillory's Chew. And you look back 10 years ago or something like that, and um, it'd be hard to imagine a book like that existing. And then it came out seven years ago, and it's won Eisner's, and it's sold – I. I, th- I think it's coming out in Poland next, and it's probably going to sell well there, and it's a great book. But for something like this, like the Black Monday murders, it's heavily based on the Illuminati that's controlling the world through economics. And, like, you're actually getting into real economic principles. And it- it's hard to imagine a comic like that if you were – like, if you were telling me a comic like that was going to exist 10 years ago, I may not have believed you. Do you feel enabled by the way that image works to, you know, really find the stories that work completely for you rather than, I don't know, 
trying to find something that puts you in a box or something like that? Um, well, I've, I've never, if, if I'm being completely honest, I've never felt constrained that way in at all. Um, I, I started at image, you know, Eric picked my submission out of a pile of mail and gave me my first gig. And, Mm -hmm. um, after, and that was the nightly news, which was an, it's certainly an unconventional book. Um, and, and, after that, I told him I wanted to do, to do three other books, and they were three different genres. And he said sure to all of those, and I did all of those. Um, I, I, I haven't had Marvel say no to me on, on anything, really. I mean, I've had almost all of my pitches approved. Um, you know, I did that S.H.I.E.L.D. book over there, which is not your typical Marvel book. Um, I, I, I think... I think people that believe in those kind of restrictions or constraints uh, are 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 looking for excuses to pitch uh, boring shit, <laughs> and um, you know, like like they try like like if somebody is asked for a pitch for I don't know what's a DC book that's obscure uh, the Blackhawks or something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah, and 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 people are asked to pitch a Blackhawks book and and what they pitch is a blackhawks book and <laughs> and i understand the logic of that like that makes perfectly good sense that you would pitch a blackhawks book to be the blackhawks book but the blackhawks book fails mm-hmm. and therefore <laughs> kind of logically you should not be pitching a Blackhawks book for the Blackhawks book anymore. <laughs> you you need to you need to look at it in a different way. And I I just think there are interesting stories, good stories, and I think there are boring stories and bad stories. Mm-hmm. And and I think that you should be pitching. Uh, now listen, you have to be able to tell the story. I mean, you you can't say, listen, I really want to do a She Hulk story where she loses her law license. And instead becomes an engineer building space stations, <laughs> which whatever, what, whatever, that may be a cool book, but you got to have the story, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, um, and this is why I'll never write She-Hulk, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's, you've got to pitch something that's dynamic and you've got to not pitch another zombie book. Like mm. you can't, you can't pitch that. Like that is, that is a bad pitch. Uh, most of the time, most of the time. Um, and so you, you just have to be super, that that's kind of a career thing. Like you have to be super aggressive, not only about what you want to do, but coming at it from a direction that is unique to you and not being the guy who tells a black Hawk story. Mm-hmm. Um, those those guys are a dime a dozen and they will replace you like that and your career will be over before it began and you will wonder what went wrong because you at, were asked to pitch a black hawk story and you just pitched a black hawk story how could this have gone wrong uh and the answer is you're boring mm-hmm. and, and 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 with entertainment as pervasive as it is if you were pitching boring predictable stuff you're dead from, from day one. Um, and, and, you know, this could be a broader argument about the kind of product that Marvel and DC puts out a lot of the times, or even IDW or even, uh, what any of the licensed stuff, you know, where, where, where you enter the books with an expectation of what you're going to get and you get exactly that. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that's bad. Um, and, and so, you have to war against that. Uh, so that's a really long winded answer of saying, I don't, I don't fear, uh, pitching, uh, original concepts or books that I think are interesting because I know that image is interested in books that are good and interesting and they want to do cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you know, Eric Stevenson at all, um, you know, you, you should know, whether you're dead on arrival or not, based on what you're what you're pitching, um, and that's one of the luxuries of knowing Eric Stevenson. So, mm-hmm. well, I, I do think it's funny. So we talked a while ago for a design article I did, and one of the things you talked about was you more or less said that you 
that you know when working the design elements into Avengers and New Avengers and Fantastic Four and everything like that, uh, one of the things you basically said was you told Marvel you wanted to do that, and they said okay. And I do think that you're definitely right that a lot of people, the reason we don't see things like that and more outside the box approaches to pitches is a lot of times people do put themselves in that box. It's fascinating. It's it's interesting to see and. You know, we talked about Tom Mueller before when I and uh, when, when I was talking to you for that design article. And that's something I really appreciate about Tom is Tom is coming from a perspective where he's not looking at comics as comics. He's looking at comics as trying to make beautiful, informative pieces of art that enhance the story. And I appreciate like it, it's like you were saying, if, if you just pick something up and it's exactly what you think it'll be, you won't feel anything. But if you pick something up. And it feels like that Black Widow issue, it didn't feel like any other Black Widow comic I'd ever read. It felt like something different. And so I felt something, you know, very strongly for it. Uh, But if I just read something where she went on a mission or did her typical spy stuff, I probably wouldn't feel too much for it. It is interesting how as much as people like to put, you know, certain publishers in a box, it's sometimes, sometimes you have to wonder how complicit the people who make the comics are in that, like, I don't want, I, I, I know that kind of sounds judgy, but I don't know. Uh, it, it, you have to wonder. No, there are people out there in our industry that have always wanted to write uh, Chris Claremont's X-Men books. And, and, and when they get a chance, they write a Chris Claremont X-Men book, and then they figure out why Chris Claremont isn't writing X-Men book anymore, and neither are they. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just um, – it, it's it's – it's bad. It's mm-hmm. bad. So I, I wanted to actually ask, is uh, is the main reason, uh, you know, a- a- after Secret Wars, you're, you're off doing your image stuff now. And I know you made that tweet the other day about, about DC and destroying the universe. And promptly there were news articles about, could Jonathan Hickman be moving to DC and everything like that? Um, is it really... Um, are you just at a point in your career where there's no reason you shouldn't be telling your own stories? Is that basically where you're where you're at in your career? No, no, I, I I wouldn't agree with that. Like that is a, that is a, a, that that's one of those things. that's a hard and a fast rule where you're like, I'm only doing creator own books now. And I would, and I would never do anything else. Like, I don't, I don't work that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I do what I want to, I do. I I have the privilege of being able to do what I want to do. Uh, and to say that there aren't other Marvel or DC books that I wouldn't want to do would be dishonest because I grew up reading those comics and I love those comics. Mm-hmm. Um, but the re- at the market realities are also, I-, I have to take a pay cut to do a Marvel or a DC book. And I know that sounds crazy to some people who listen to these things and don't understand how the current market is working. Um, but, but it is absolutely um, you, you are doing those books for the eyeballs on them, not for the paycheck. Um, now I have been paid very well by Marvel. I have, I have Marvel has, has done right by me and I am very appreciative of them and they have, um, never done anything but treated me very, very well. Um, and, and I have, I have done better than of the vast majority of professionals in our industry at Marvel. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, I, it would be irresponsible for me to be anything but grateful, but, but the economic realities of what's going on at image right now just means that you're going to take a pay cut to do a Marvel or DC book. Uh, if, if, if in, in my, in my situation, mm-hmm. um, so for me to do one of those books, it, it, it's, it's just not, it's not about the money. It, it's more about, is it an important book? Is it, is it a book that'll get a bunch of eyeballs on, on me? You know, am I doing it for self-promotion? And right now I don't, I don't really, I don't know that I need that. I just did a bunch of really big books. Mm -hmm. I I don't know that, I don't know that I can, I can, I don't know that I can become any more market saturated. (laughs) Um, so, so for me, it's so right now it is solely about what are the stories that I would love to tell? And certainly if I had a story that I really wanted to tell at Marvel or, or DC, then 
uh, I, I would be happy to have a conversation with them and I would and will have conversations with them uh, because I have good relationships at, at the people that run those companies. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now I'm doing my own stuff because that's what I want to do. And I, 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 and I kind of need to do right now. I'm, I, I need to recharge telling stories that aren't superhero stories. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would never get to a place where I'm at, where I act like I'm too good for that stuff or that it's beneath me or that it's, um, I, I have no emotional connection to the material. I mean, my God, look at, look at, um, here's somebody I totally respect and, 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 um, just appreciate, uh, unconditionally. Mark Wade is an impressive guy mm-hmm. and, and you look at what he has done over the period of time that he's been in the business and he's done everything. Um, and, and there is nothing wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he would argue that he has done plenty of stuff wrong <laughs> and would then tell you an amazing story about what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, he's been in, he's been in the he's been in the industry for over 20 years and has done some seminal stuff, but he still, still loves doing black widow books, you know? Uh, so I, I, I just, um, uh, yeah, I'm not doing it right now, but I'm, I'm, I would never say that I wasn't going to do it anymore. Oh yeah. And, And, and I definitely didn't mean you were on some sort of permanent hiatus or something like that. More in a sense that you just feel like, you're at a place where you want to focus on your own projects for a bit, especially considering the fact that like, like you were saying, you were, you were doing an unbelievable amount of issues, Avengers of Avengers and new Avengers every year. But um, I think you're kind of right. I, I, I don't really know where you'd go after secret wars in terms of market saturation. I think that got your name out there pretty well. Yeah. We sold a few of those. Just a few. Yeah. So um, I want to ask about a little bit about the economics of you know, how your stuff works at Image. And I was actually talking to, uh, I had a guest on my podcast who doesn't work in comics. We were just talking, actually, if I'm being honest, we were really talking about the NBA most of the time. But uh, we ended up talking about your your work and we were talking about reading it in single issues versus trades. And I'm sure you've heard a hugely divergent set of answers, but it, it seems like some people are all trades, some people are all singles for you. Uh, but I have to ask, do you find that your work does particularly well in collections, especially considering the fact that you have both, you know, trades and hardcovers flavors for everyone? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do well in trades. Uh, we have sold, we have sold a bunch of trades, uh, sold a bunch of Manhattan projects in East of West. Um, it was really, uh, interesting to watch Nick Dragata kind of, kind of learn all of that, um, uh, because, um, you know, early on, he was really stressing out because we were losing some monthly readers. And I told him, I told him that some of that is completely natural, but there's also another dynamic going on, which is, uh, we're almost certainly now, cause we were on issue like nine or 10 or something like that. Maybe the second trade had come out. Uh, and I, and I told him, I was like, we almost certainly have convert or are converting people to just buying our book in trade. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can't really – one, I'm not going to lose any sleep about it because there's nothing we can do. I mean it isn't like we're not trying to do a good book. And so if we're, tr- so if we're trying to do a good book and, it, and we feel like the book is good and we're trying as hard as we can, all we can do is put it out there and see if people like it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when we started getting returns on – like we get a cr- – we have accrual periods at Image where we get uh, paid twice a year on half of half – of, um, you know, what it sells for half of a year, January through June and, and then July through December. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when we started getting accrual checks in, uh, he understood what I was talking about because we, we were, were very, very healthy there. And so it turns into a thing where, yes, you're losing monthly readers, but if you're selling an, uh, an extra, 20,000 or 50,000 or like Robert Kirkman, a million trades, right? Um, those readers count. And 
And if you're into the economics of it, then you also make a dollar more, usually a dollar more a trade than you would in the combined amount of of the of the monthly issues. Um, yeah, and of course, that depends. Uh, that varies from price point to price point. But um, y- there's nothing wrong with people that read books and trades. They're they're some of our best customers, and they're some of our highest paying customers. And um, and the truth is, is that they like they like the delivery mechanism of the trade. It's a it's a pretty book, and it's well put together. And um, it's a very healthy segment of images business overall. Uh, it continues to grow and, um, Eric and Robert have been very smart about the people that they're hiring to help us sell even more trades. And so, um, image is a, image is a very, very, um, good place to be. And it's a very exciting place to be. And, uh, it's really good for the vast majority of the creators that are there. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I, th- I think it's kind of interesting. It's one of the interesting things about creator owned is I think a lot of times people will just look at the single issue sales and they'll just see, you know, not, not that Nick should have known better or something like that, but you'll see the sales dropping on the single issues and stuff like that. But, you know, like you said, a lot of people are converting. It's not people just dropping the book. They're converting over to trades or they're converting to hardcovers and things like that. Um, for me, I can't stop buying single issues monthly because I'm a horrific addict, but I sometimes think about it because we, you know, when you start stacking up long box after long box and you just have to put them somewhere, you, you, you look at a collection and it's very enticing. It's, it's very enticing to think about switching over to trades or, or hardcovers or some other medium like that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I... I, I I got rid of my long boxes a, a long time ago. Um, they're they're in. I put them in storage, and then I lost them in storage, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> um, but I I um I, I I think we're selling like people people kind of bad mouth the direct market, but in terms of of delivering. Um, both the monthly stuff and fulfilling the trade stuff right now, they're, they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, I, I, uh, I, uh, it could be, it could be much, much worse. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, l- last two questions for you. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about was, I remember a while ago, maybe last year sometime you tweeted about the nine ninety nine price point on the first volume, you know, trades. And I know that, that's getting way deep into the weeds and everything, but you were talking about how that's not, you know, it's not really your favorite thing. Uh, was that just because you kind of just feel the nine ninety nine price point is, you know, costing you guys money uh, when you, when you're selling copies, or or was it, you know, something else? Um. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and I don't want to go against what is clearly uh, a a mm-hmm. a a point of pride for, for image central. I can Um, cut this question if you want. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I'm happy. I've, I'm very vocal about this and I tell almost everybody that asked me about it. Um, here's my problem with the nine 99 price point. Um, you're asking people to basically give up half of the revenue that they would make. Um, the the math works out like i'm not going to get into what you make per book and all that kind of stuff because people might not want me giving that information out mm-hmm. but you can make the same amount of money on a little bit less than two thirds of the sales at at 14.99 as you do at 9.99 mm-hmm. and the idea that people aren't going to buy your book because it's because it's ten bucks uh, instead of because uh, it's fifteen bucks instead of ten books ten bucks is is certainly a, a logical point to argue. Um, but I am opposed to bargain based pricing in general. Mm-hmm. Like I I do not think that the 
Amazon nature of of pricing everything is necessarily a good thing, especially if you're talking about something that you think has real value. Mm -hmm. And I have a fundamental problem with the idea that it's okay for Marvel and DC to charge $19 and $25 for their trades that aren't put together in any way that's remotely as good as the trades that I'm putting together together at image. I, I, I disagree fundamentally with that. On top of that, um, you could make an argument that for the most part, most of the image creators are in essence, are, are, are essentially in a boutique business and that they are not going to sell the same kind of numbers that, um, I have or, 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 uh, Brian and Fiona have, or Kieran and Jamie have on Wicked and Divine, or what um, uh, what Matt and Chip have on Sex Criminals. I mean, those books are moving a hundred thousand copies. Okay, mm-hmm. um, if your trade is going to sell fifteen thousand copies because you are creator A that nobody has heard of, and this is your first image book. It's crazy not to maximize your money because you're you're talking about a book that sold anywhere that may have launched at 12,000 copies and ended up selling 8,000 copies or 6,000 copies or whatever. And if you print 15,000 of them and you immediately sell 5,000 of them, you're immediately in the black and you're just, you just, it, it's so important at the bottom of, of the, of the, of the sales chart. When you're an image creator, when you're doing creator own and it's your money it's important for you to make enough money to live on. And, and I just, I I do not agree with giving your product away if you're not guaranteed volume. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and a lot of these guys are not guaranteed volume. And it's the, the idea of selling 3000 more trades at, at $10 than, than selling 3000 less at $15. And if you're talking about the difference between 12,000 copies and 15,000 copies, you just lost like eight to $10,000. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the economics of it are not your friend. If you're not moving enough, enough, enough copies. Um, my art, look, that that's the economics of it. My argument is I don't want to give my stuff away for cheap. Mm-hmm. Because I think my books are better than Image and DC. I mean, than Marvel and DC books, and and I do not want. I, I do not want to see the higher price point to an inferior product. I, I disagree. I fundamentally disagree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's you know that that's the market and and how you feel about. Um, do you want to buy IKEA or Pottery Barn? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 all of those arguments. Um, um, so I, I I those are my opinions on it. I know that a bunch of people at Image disagree with me, uh, but the cool thing about Image is that you can set the prices for your own books um, because they're your books. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it is an interesting point because I talk to a lot of retailers for articles, and one of the things I find to be really interesting is how many of them have indicated that they don't really feel like readers are overly price sensitive anymore. And a lot of times those first volumes can be, uh, they can cost both you and the retailer money because, you know, they could sell Saga volume one for $15. That wouldn't be difficult. Um, or like really any of the image volume ones. It is an interesting argument because I totally see both sides. I mean, I'm sure you, you could see the other side of the argument too, but um, you know, maybe more people will buy nine 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 instead of fourteen nine nine. But it is an interesting subject to me because I don't know. I uh, I easily. Uh, well, uh, I remember. I I remember when I first started doing Image Comics, and we had two to three percent of the market, and my wife and I had gambled everything on on me being able to become a comic book creator. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we had saved up money and we were running out of money. And I remember when I got a check for, for one of my issues of Pax Romana and it made my wife cry, Mm -hmm. uh, because, because of how little money it was and how we were bleeding through our savings. And 
I can't tell you how precarious of a time it is when you are first starting out in this industry. The, the, the money is at, it's like everything else. The money is at the top. And if you are starting out, you have to be hyper aggressive and you have to be lean. Like, I don't understand creators that come into the industry and they have, uh, and it's their very first book and nobody knows who they are yet. Uh, but they have themselves as the writer and they have an artist and an inker and a colorist and a letterer and, uh, and, and, and an editor. And they're all trying to make money on selling 4,000 copies a month. Mm-hmm. And, and my point on that is letter the fucking book yourself. Yeah. You know, uh, color the book yourself, learn an extra skill, make yourself more valuable. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so, it's so hard when you f- are first breaking in and you have to be just so smart about how you handle it because, uh, you can die in those first two years so easily. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's always, it, it, it's always in the back of my head, uh, uh the decisions that I make. Um, not because, um, <laughs> I live in fear, but because I, I, it was a short time ago. I remember, you know, I, I, I remember sweating it out. Um, I remember when my heart used to break at a, at a bad review. <laughs> now, now I laugh at them. <laughs> I'm always curious about that. I, you know, I always felt like that wasn't something that, um, you know, really phases you when, when, when you see them. I don't, I, yeah, I don't read. Yeah, I don't read any of that stuff anymore. Uh, when you reach, uh, this goes back to that thing about about people reading image books for the creators and reading Marvel books for Hulk, you know, mm-hmm. or Thor. When when you start doing books on big enough franchise properties, there's going to be a percentage of noise that's bad, no matter what, mm-hmm. uh, and and aggressively bad. Mm-hmm. And at that point, if you don't stop then um that gets some people Mm -hmm. well like that like 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 that absolutely gets to some people and and they start writing for those people and they start uh they start changing what kind of creator they are to try and cut off that kind of noise and um when you start compromising like that you you, you're you're dead it just hasn't caught up with you yet Mm -hmm. um but you you have to shut all that out. You 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 have to stop looking at it because if you if you do look at it, it it it, it will affect you. It, it, look, there's no way that you can read on Twitter. Um, I remember when I used to like comics. Uh, I believe it was around the year that Jonathan Hickman got his first job or something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I stopped liking comics, it was when Jonathan Hickman entered the industry. You know, and, and, and it's like one of those things where I was like, well, that's clever. That's a nice turn of phrase. Uh, but, you know, go to hell, right? <laughs> so, I'm, sh- I'm sure your name was tagged in there too. I, only, only, only my wife gets to talk to me like that. <laughs> and, it, and it hurts that she agrees with you. <laughs> you know? um, no, you, you really, you have to shut... You have to shut all of that. You have to stop reading the reviews and all that kind of stuff. It just – it doesn't matter. When when you're on the Avengers, your book is not going to get canceled and it doesn't matter what you sell. It doesn't matter if you lose 10,000 readers. You know that you're going to get them back whenever you do the big pop. And mm-hmm. it's just – at any point in time, Marvel marketing can sell 30,000 copies of whatever they want. They can, they can jack up their orders by 30,000 anytime David Gabriel wants to. Mm-hmm. Um Cause he's that good at his job and they know how to, they know how to, to motivate the market. So, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I, uh, I would say I get one, like 1000th of the taste of what a comic creator gets on social media. And I'm just like, how do you guys deal with it? Um, but I actually, I talked to Sanford green about this on a podcast, not that long ago. And he'd probably the best method of anybody. And he said for power man and iron fist, he was like, I just scheduled a signing on the day of the book's release. That way I was completely away from the internet. And and I thought that was really smart. You know, get away from it. I mean, it can be really really bad. Uh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's um it, listen, part of it is wonderful, uh but part of it is evil. And that's kind of that's kind of the world and 
uh, you have to deal with it in some way. And a really, really good way is to not pay attention to any of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the, the last question for you, um, I want to get back to East of West one last time. Um, and issue number 25 is coming out the week after this podcast is going to drop. And it's the beginning of the end of the second year of the apocalypse per solicits. That's a, te- that's a terrible sentence. I don't know who wrote that, but that's a terrible sentence. Uh, but I mean, it, it kind of is like it's, um, it's Prophet Ezra Orion getting his new crew together for an excellent meeting, I'm sure. And uh, everyone got invited by their scrolls that were written on the back of some man, actually. Um, and anyways, the new Chosen are getting together. I have to ask, I know you can't really play favorites, but despite your Wild Wild West tweet from last night, is Archibald Chamberlain your favorite? Do you do you love him most? Can you love someone the most? Uh, no, I absolutely love him most. I, I don't think I, – and I intentionally don't put him in the book as much as I would <laughs> if, 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 I, if I had my druthers. Uh-huh. You know? uh, but uh, no, he's, he's absolutely – he could talk about anything forever and it's just – uh, it's all like poison and honey. It's fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, I, I do think it's funny. He's the one person who talked his way out of death, literally, and that's the moment where I was like, "Oh man, Hickman's all up in this guy's business. He loves this guy." Well, there's a um, there's a lot. Well, the the final we're doing the the end of year two ends at issue thirty, mm-hmm. and so uh, we'll we'll wrap that up and then. Um, all of the stuff that happens in year three as we're racing to the conclusion is all just like it's, it's, uh, we've set it all up so beautifully. And, um, there's a, there's just a lot of, uh, fantastic stuff. And speaking of Archibald, he's got some just killer stuff in the back, (laughs) in the back half of the book. Um, and, uh, it's just, it's thinking about it makes me smile because it's just going to be so much fun. And that guy, that guy, uh, that guy will steal a couple of issues. His best, his best days are before him. So. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you, I'm, I'm very excited to see where it goes, but I hope somebody takes out balloon because fuck that guy. Fuck balloon. I hate balloon. He's, he's the devil pretty much. Um, well, he's, he's the iPad, right? He's the, uh, He's the he's the he's the iPhone. He's um, he's not good for you. I, I find it hilarious that you said that right as I was actually picking up my own iPad so I could look at Archibald Chamberlain's last line in number twenty two, which was a particularly juicy one. Um, anyways, thank you so much for coming on the show, Jonathan. I'm really excited to see where everything goes. And issue number twenty five is coming out a week from today. The you know, or at least a week from the day this goes up. I'm very excited to see where uh, you know, where it goes. And thanks again. Of course, anytime. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel from Sketch.com. You can find this week's guest, Jonathan Hickman, on Twitter at at jhickman and his work in East of West, The Dying and the Dead, The Manhattan Projects, and the upcoming The Black Monday Murders, all at Image Comics. You can find more Sketch content at Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D dot com. Follow us on Twitter at at Sketched Comic. Like us on Facebook at Slash Sketched. And if you're an iTunes listener, give us a rating review. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.